before I introduce our speaker, I would like to uh, call upon a little bit of my past experience as a salesman, Doug. Hmm? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you did it to me again. <laughs> Let me talk about the book just a little bit. This is a, an excellent work, a great deal of fine thinking has gone into it, I believe would be a, a real asset, not only to your library, but to your living the Christian life. And you can acquire this great volume for a mere $17. But wait, you can double your order and you can add the second one for no extra charge other than pay the handling charge, which happens to be $17. <laughs> so <laughs> buy one, get one free. <laughs> Now, if you haven't seen that commercial on TV or those like that, you haven't been, been paying attention. Brother Gary Summers has completed 40 years of preaching in June of 2012, so you're starting on the next decade, I guess, huh? He served six con congregations in Pennsylvania, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Texas, and Florida. He and his wife Barbara have been married for 48 years. They have two children and four grandchildren. And we're particularly pleased to have his wife with us this, this lectureship. He's a genuine English scholar in my estimation. I was particularly impressed with his previous lecture and it impressed me the way he took his topic and took it apart, laid it out for us, explained all the the ins and outs of it and put it back together and it just made sense, it worked. And uh, I trust that he's gonna do something similar to that again, so we look forward to Gary speaking to us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here again and we always appreciate the hospitality that's been shown and I know everyone feels that way that's a guest, a speaker this week. We have a large task before us because we're going to be trying to contrast the works of the flesh, which are several, uh, with being filled with the fruit of the Spirit. What is it about the flesh that we find so fascinating? People have become so enamored with material concerns that they scarcely seem to have time for spiritual thoughts in our society today. The obvious observation is that worldly interests appeal to people because they provide enjoyment. No one forces drinkers to buy beer or consume wine. Men are not forced or coerced into buying pornographic magazines or paying for cable channels to view sexual perversions. The police do not issue tickets to women who refuse to go to shopping at the mall and uh, spend more money than they should. God gave us physical senses of sight and sound, touch, smell, taste to use, but so often we have chosen to abuse them instead. Legitimate God-given sense, uh, senses cannot lead us into immorality or ill health if we fail to discipline ourselves. We have to do better than that. Let's look at a couple of verses prior to what we're going to be looking at. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 and 18. And this leads in to the passage we're going to be discussing this hour. Galatians 5, 16. But this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh... And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. To walk in the Spirit is to be led, or to be led by Him means to comply with His teachings, which is easy enough to say, but we live in a world that appeals to our senses which can distract us and lead us away from the Spirit's teachings. 
If we find ourselves conflicted, it will be difficult to develop the fruit of the Spirit which God has given as a goal for every Christian. Nowhere is this contrast set forth more clearly than Galatians 5, 19 through 24. The New Testament complain, uh, contains plenty of lists of sins. Uh, Matthew 15, 19, Romans 1, 26 through 32, 1 Corinthians 5, 11, uh, Ephesians 4, 25 through 31, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, Revelation 21, 8. You can find all manner of lists of sins as well as passages that describe the good qualities that Christians ought to possess. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. But Galatians 5, 19 through 23, provides us the greatest contrast between the influences of the flesh and the spirit. Let's go ahead and read those, and then we're going to look at the uh, nine aspects of the fruit of the spirit and contrast what we have in the way of the works of the flesh with each one of those. Beginning with Galatians 5.19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. When one becomes a Christian... He dies to sin, that is, to the works of the flesh. And he's buried, and then he is raised up to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 3 through 5, as he begins to live according to the teachings of the Holy Spirit, fruit results. And uh, so let's take a look at each one of these, beginning with love. Now, as Brother Jeff Litke said this morning, the word agape is one of the most well-known words in the New Testament. It's the highest type of love. It's not that which is self-seeking, but truly desires the well-being of others. The Christian does not seek the harm of anyone, but always pursues what is good for himself and for others. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 the greatest example of love is Jesus, who put our spiritual needs above his own comfort, his own well-being. He put us ahead, and that showed the love that he had for all mankind. In contrast to the noble quality of love, the works of the flesh produce these things, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, and envy. Can any one of these be said to spring from a loving heart? Do these things characterize Jesus? Hatred belongs to Satan, who despises both God and man. The word translated contentions in the New King James, variants in the King James, comes from the Greek word eris, Eris was also the name of a Greek goddess. And uh, what that person was goddess over is easily seen when you hear that the Latin version of this god, goddess, was discordia. Yes, Eris is the goddess of discord. As these names suggest, Eris means strife, discord, contentions. One might uh, wonder if this word is related to the charge that Jude gave to contend for the faith. No, it's a different word entirely. Eris carries with it no honorable concept whatsoever, as in striving for what is good or right. It only refers to strife for its own sake. Love does not uh, stir up needless controversies that might separate brethren from one another. Paul uses the related form of eris just three words later, which is translated selfish ambition 
in the New King James and strife in the King James. Paul specifically says that Christians should not do anything through strife. Philippians 2, 3. The word translated jealousies in the New King James, emulations in the King James, comes from zelos, which uh, we get the word zeal from. And so it does have a positive sense, but it also has a negative sense. In its positive sense, zeal refers to positive energy on behalf of God or his servants. However, it can also refer to negative enthusiasm, such as the Jews who were full of envy at the gospel's success and opposed Paul, Acts 13 and verse 45. The word also may refer to brethren who might be envious of one another, James chapter 3 and verse 14. Hatreds, contentions, strife, jealousies, and certainly uh, are certainly at odds with the practice of love, part of the fruit of the Spirit. Next, let's notice joy. Whereas the works of the flesh satisfy both the carnal and the natural man, joy refers to the satisfaction of the soul. The verb form, to rejoice, occurs where sins have been forgiven. The eunuch went on his way rejoicing, Acts 8.39. It refers to that when brethren do the right thing, as in repenting, 2 Corinthians 7.9, or when we realize what a privilege and joy it is just to be a Christian. Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say rejoice, Philippians 4, 4. Joy does not depend on outward circumstances because Jesus taught his followers to rejoice and be exceeding glad even when they were persecuted, Matthew chapter 5, uh, 10 and verse 12. One work of the flesh cited by Paul that proves especially contrary to joy is outbursts of wrath. The book of Revelation speaks of God's wrath ten times, but his wrath is perfect. It involves emotion, but it is just, and it is based upon facts. When he brings wrath upon the ungodly, he is totally fair, having warned all mankind through the preaching of his word, 2 Corinthians 5.11. When Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, he did not do so in a fit of rage. They had made the Father's house a den of thieves. The wrath he displayed reflected righteous anger. The justice he administered did not detract from the joy that he possessed. However, man's imperfect wrath will probably disturb his joy make him bitter, and if he inflicts his own personal vengeance on somebody else, it might be unjust, it might even be excessive. He may pay back double what he has received because he is so outraged. Christians should concentrate on joy regardless of the way that we might have been treated by others. The third one is peace. The Christian uh, walks in peace if he is being led by the Spirit. And that peace is valuable. It's peace with God himself. Although sin has, at some point in our lives, separated us from God, God is the one who find, uh, found a way that that fellowship could be restored. That fellowship we lost. Colossians 1.20, And by him to reconcile all things to himself, uh, whether things on earth or in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Having an ironic spirit does not mean Christians cannot oppose sin or error, but that's what many mean when they use that concept. One contending for the faith can still be at peace with God because he knows he's doing the right things. Paul wrote that Jesus himself is our in the sense that he abolished that which separated Jews from Gentiles. In Christ, we all have access to the Father through uh, Jesus Christ, through the teachings of the Holy Spirit, as, for example, in Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. Christians, therefore, have peace with God and with one another. 
Paul admonished the church at Ephesus to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4.3 Paul was constantly embattled by those who opposed the preaching of the gospel with false brethren, and yet he experienced peace and uh, sent greetings of peace in many of his letters. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, and envy do not characterize the Christian who has peace. Two or three more characteristics, depending on the Greek text used, could be added to this list, dissensions, heresies, and murders, the last of which is only in the King James and the New King James. Uh, dissensions uh, or seditions in the King James is rendered divisions, and it is found a couple of times in the New Testament. It is included along with envy and strife in 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. Paul warns brethren to mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that they have learned in Romans 16, 17. Divisions may occur then based on what? Well, sometimes it's based on personalities. There's not peace between brethren. Or the uh, problem could exist because of false doctrine. Either of these threatens the peace that ought to exist in the body of Christ and is inspired of fleshly thinking rather than spiritual. Heresies is simply a transliteration of the Greek noun hieresis, which is translated six times as sect in the New King James, once as factions, and twice as heresies. The other usage is 2 Peter 2.1, where the apostle prophesies there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. In that text, the heresy involves uh, attempts to justify immorality, as we talked about previously. But in Galatians, the heresy that Paul deals with involves the Judaizing teachers and their false doctrine that the law of Moses must be observed by Christians. Whatever it might be that departs from clear New Testament teaching is a heresy and must be opposed. And it does not contradict love, joy, and peace when it does so. Now, you'll just have to read the book to see some of the comments on murders. Uh, that uh, are in there. Uh, we just haven't got time to do everything. But we would like to mention envy that characterized the Jews. It was out of envy that they crucified the Lord. And there is a legitimate contrast between the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh as it regards envy. And perhaps maybe Paul has something in mind that involve these two as he writes Galatians. Who is it that has shown the works of the flesh? The Jews, when they killed Jesus? Were they not factious? Did not they exhibit hatred? And how far were they from murder at any given time? They not only killed Stephen also later on, which was against Roman law, but they constantly followed Paul and stirred up the people to stone him. What better way to contrast Judaism, the adherence of Judaism, and the adherence of Christianity than to show where both of these lead? One of them leads to envy, strife, murder, the other to the blessed teachings of Jesus Christ, of love, joy, peace, and so on. Why then would the Judaizing teachers want to promote that which had led to those things instead of the Christian doctrine. Long-suffering is the next term. This compound word uh, in the Greek comes from one that is translated wrath, already mentioned, and makros meaning long. The idea seems to be taking a long time before coming to wrath long suffering more of us need more patience in our daily lives 
not only do we need to be long-suffering with our brethren, we also need uh, to be long-suffering with those who are outside the body of Christ. As Solomon wrote, it is honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. Proverbs 20 and verse 3. Exercising patience and refraining one's tongue will stop many a conflict. But let's move on to kindness. In recent years, some have been promoting the concept of doing random acts of kindness. That's a good idea. Maybe some have been promoting this because so often... People generally exhibit a, uh, well, just selfishness. Not kindness, but selfishness. Of the ten times the Greek word is used in the New Testament, the King James renders it as good or goodness five times, kindness four times, and once as gentleness in this text. The New King James renderings are identical except for Galatians 5.22 in which it does use the word kindness. Now, we make decisions about kindness every day. I, what should you do with a limerick like this one? Would it be kind to use it? Well, let's, let's try it. There once was a preacher named Hightower who could speak without pause for five hours. When he stopped for air, why, no one was there. He's as effective as a dry shower. Well now, and Lynn Parker did not give that to me. <laughs> he would have done it much better, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, is that a kind thing to say? Now, I know what some people are thinking. Well, you know, but it's true. Well, that's not the point, though. <laughs> you don't have to say everything that's true. Sometimes it's just not kind to say those things. Well, let's go on to number six, goodness. The sixth part of the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, and it's related to the adjective good, which results in benevolent actions towards others. We cannot define goodness without thinking of God and using his definitions. We say that Abraham was a good person because he worshiped God and, had, and did many other things of a noble nature. Uh, he rescued Lot. Um, Ruth and Esther must be classified as good because they were unselfish and helpful. Jonathan was a man of faith in battle and of loyalty uh, to his friend David. Dorcas was both kind and good, and many others could be listed. We ought to think of what good we can do for others. Now, here's another one for Terry, but uh, this one illustrates his goodness. There, once, uh, there was a logician named Terry who generally was quite merry. He got in a fight with a Deverite and demolished his adversary. Well, now that brings out the more positive aspects uh, that he is capable of doing. And it would be good to read that one. But let's move on to faithfulness. The Greek word for faithfulness is the usual word for faith. But from the American standard onward, virtually all translations have faithfulness instead of faith. Christians do not become spiritual giants overnight. Faith comes by hearing and meditating on the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, 1 Peter 2, 2. This growth in the life of a child of God is vital. We trusted in God enough to save us from our sins. Do we trust Him now in all other aspects of our lives? We trusted Him to save us. Do we trust Him every day? Do we trust His providence, His care, for us. We must be faithful in all aspects of our lives. Noah is a good example of faithfulness. Thus did Noah. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. Genesis 6 and verse 21. In other words, Noah was faithful to God, and we know that because he did all that God wanted him to do. We know, uh, and several times it's been mentioned, that Abraham is the father of the faithful. 
And so this ought to be said of each one of us. Every Christian should be working at making himself better and more faithful so that everybody can say, these are faithful brethren. This is a faithful Christian, a faithful child of God. Someone like Moses who is faithful in all of God's house. Despite these superb examples, the nation of Israel, fathered by Abraham and taught God's law by Moses, departed into idolatry. Idolatry and sorcery are listed of two of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5.20. No one can be called faithful to God who engages in either one of these sins. Idolatry was a recurring sin in Israel for, what, hundreds of years? The people were generally enticed by the gods of the nations around them. In fact, Amaziah was so foolish that after he, with the Lord's help, defeated Edom, he brought the gods of the people of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down before them and burned incense before them. 1 Kings 25, 14. Where was the king's mind in de devising this defeating strategy? Uh, you picture him saying, hey, these gods couldn't stand before our God, Jehovah. Why don't we worship these losers? Let's bring them back and set them up. He abandoned them and couldn't get a victory for them, so let's make him our God. This would be kind of analogous to replacing a Super Bowl winning quarterback with an untried rookie for no reason. Anyone who imagines the outrage the fans would have over something like that might well understand how God felt about him in that strategy. Idols do not, of course, need to be made of wood or stone. Paul said that covetousness was idolatry, Ephesians 5, 5, Colossians 3, 5. Truly, the love of money or possessions characterizes people in today's world. 1 Timothy 6.10 Is it possible that we have also made a few other things into idols, such as music, television, video games, in short, entertainment, computers, texting? I, I know, I quit preaching and went to meddling, didn't I? But... Have we made these things gods in place of Jehovah? Are these things more important? Notice things. Are these things more important than Almighty God? The Creator who created us, is He not greater than these inferior products to which we give so much attention? The other word, pharmakeia, from which pharmacy is transliterated in our language, is translated witchcraft in the King James and the NIV, sorcery in the New King James American Standard and New American Standard. In the first century, sorcerers often accomplished their magical arts with the accompaniment of drugs. Simon bewitched the people of Samaria with sorceries, and uh, the Greek word magia, from which we get magic, uh, he used his power to convince people that he was someone great. In fact, they gave heed to him, and he didn't discourage them from doing so. In fact, he kind of gave the impression that he was some great one, that he had the great power of God, Acts 8, 9, and 10. Thus, the people believed in him more than God until... Philip went there and they saw true miracles and signs. Magicians and sorcerers have been using their deceptive powers as far back as the time of Moses. The Septuagint uses pharmacos in Deuteronomy 18.11 as the equivalent for the Hebrew word translated sorcery. After the worldwide flood, man uh, pursued idolatry in the world and uh, let anything practically from Romans chapter 1 take the place of the creator it was foolish at its origin professing themselves wise they became fools and it's just as foolish to do so today 
God desires men and women who will turn from dumb idols to serve the living and true God, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, and then remain faithful. The next word is gentleness or meekness. The King James and uh, the American Standard use meek and meekness, but more recent translations and paraphrases use gentle and gentleness. The Greek word means attitude uh, devoid of intolerance and bitterness. It is strength and gentleness all at the same time. That's the kind of characteristic that we're talking about. To say it simply, the word beginning at Galatians 5 and verse 23 means strength under control, which serves as a good lead-in to the next and final element of the fruit of the Spirit, and that is self-control, or what some translations have as temperance. Virtually every translation since the King James uh, which chose temperance, has chosen the word self-control in the translation. In the world of the first century, sexual sins were common, just as they are today. Generally, they are, result, uh, are the result of a lack of self-control. God created mankind, male and female, with a legitimate sexual appetite. Men and women have throughout the history of the world not been bashful about going outside of those boundaries, though, outside of the boundaries of marriage in order to seek fulfillment of those desires. The Greek word translated fornication includes every type of sexual immorality. And, you know, that includes casual sex, living together, living outside of marriage, affairs, adultery, uh, both extramarital and uh, the definition of marital adultery in Matthew 19 and verse 9, uh, as well as unauthorized uh, activities outside of marriage, such as homosexuality. Self-control is needed in order to keep this relationship between one man and one woman who are married to each other as God intended. Now, another word is Akatharsia, and that can refer either to moral or ritual uncleanness, but here it is in the moral sense. Then there's the word asylgeia, rendered as lasciviousness, licentiousness, lewdness, sensuality, wantonness, debauchery by the various translations. It's likely that this is uh, the filthiest this word describes the filthiest kind of behavior in the scriptures. Barclay wrote, in many ways, asolgeia is the ugliest word in the list of New Testament sins. He cites an unnamed writer uh, as giving this definition, violence coupled with insult and audacity. Uh, he cites another writer as the word meaning preparedness for any pleasure and Basil as a disposition of the soul which does not possess and cannot bear the pain of discipline. Art and Gingrich use licentiousness, debauchery, and they uh, follow the in inclination to sensuality, especially of sexual excesses, indecent conduct, licentious desires. Thayer points out that the word is of uncertain origin, but many believe that the word comes from the negation of Selgeis, and that Selge refers to a city in Pisidia whose citizens excel in excellence of morals. And so Ah Selge would be the opposite of that. Those who do not excel, those who don't even try to excel in the excellence of strictness of morals. So the opposite of this would be basically to be without restraint. And uh, Thayer suggests most of the definitions provided, uh, unbridled lust, excess, licentiousness, lasciviousness, wantonness, outrageousness, shamelessness, insolence. A brief phrase describing asolgeia might be lawless sensuality. 
And this individual feels no compunction to live by God's standards. He refuses to discipline himself and participates in any kind of immoral behavior that he desires. The licentious, lascivious person recognizes no restrictions. Now then, Paul also concludes his list in Galatians 5.21 with drunkenness and revelries, both of which involve giving in to fleshly appetites and not attempting to control them. Drunkenness involves the decision to drink intoxicating beverages. The very first drink affects a person's judgment and begins to break down a person's self-control. That's perhaps the reason we find in Proverbs 23, 31, do not even look upon the wine. Nothing more clearly combats the mature Christian's ability to exercise self-control than alcohol or some other drug. Revelries is just a broader term to speak of immoralities that accompany drinking, of which there are and can be several. Robertson said that komos is an old word also for drinking parties like those in honor of Bacchus. In case something was not specifically spelled out in this list, in case it wasn't specified or somebody invented some new corruption, uh, some new moral pollution, Paul includes the words and the like. Those who practice these works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. They completely contradict the character God looks for in those who have put to death the old man who have been raised to walk in newness of life. Those led by the Spirit must bear the fruit of the Spirit. Now, let's just uh, close with a few suggestions about overcoming the works of the flesh. Number one, realize that Satan knows our weaknesses and he wants us to fail. He is not a friend. He is always an adversary, an enemy. The fight is not just against an evil practice, but against the devil himself. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6 and verse 12, but against a powerful spiritual force that seeks our destruction. We must remember that. Number two, God knows our weaknesses, and he wants us to succeed. Satan knows them and wants us to fail. God knows them and wants us to succeed. Therefore, he tells us how sin operates, James 1, 12 through 15, in order to enable us to better overcome it. Number three, remember that God has given us the ability to overcome sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. God has a, provided a way out of the temptation, but we must actively look for it. Number four, realize that Jesus overcame every type of sin that we experience. Matthew 4, 1 through 11 we can cast all of our cares upon him. He knows what it's like to be a human being. First Peter 5 and verse 7. Number 5. We should not visit or even be near places where we might be tempted. You know, have you ever talked to somebody and they said, Well, you know, I really had sworn off drinking, but I was at a tavern and... What? <laughs> Why were you there? Uh, you know, why are you at a pornographic website? Why are you where there's going to be temptations? Avoid those places. Don't visit them. Don't be near them. Number six, as soon as we realize that we are thinking about committing the sin, we must refuse to allow that idea to stay in our mind and instead cast it out. Jesus warned about the problem with lust. It begins in the mind, Matthew 5, 27 and 28. If we find ourselves thinking along those lines, we should envision a figurative metal door that we're slamming. There's the thought, there's the idea, but we're slamming the door shut 
so that it does not continue to be in our minds and we block it off in order to find a righteous alternative. We dare not indulge these types of thoughts. Number seven, pray for deliverance from the problem. We should not be thinking about how good an alcoholic beverage might taste, uh, but rather ask for strength and deliverance from those things. Number eight, we must exercise self-control and resist as much as we possibly can, James 4, 7 through 10. But we should not be defeated because we slip. Sometimes people say, yeah, yeah, I got it all, I'm going to resist, and then they give in, and then they think, well, I can't do it. All right, you fail. Try it again. Eventually, the devil will have success if uh, you keep quitting. But if you are trying, you will eventually succeed and the devil will eventually lose. So, yeah, feel bad about failing, but get back and try it again. Number nine, we must fill our minds with other matters than the sin that is troubling us. <clears throat> How are we doing on memorizing scriptures? How are we doing on memorizing scripture references? Have we done uh, the visiting that we ought to have done? Have we made phone calls that we should have made? How are we progressing on our spiritual reading? When was the uh, last time that we helped somebody or conducted a Bible study? The important thing is to get our minds off the temptation and redirect our thinking and our focus to more worthwhile endeavors. Number 10, we ought to recall that Jesus, we ought to recall what Jesus did for us on the cross. If his sacrifice does not make us feel ashamed and guilty, not much else is going to motivate us. He did not give his life so that we could have the sins that we used to do and continue to walk in them. He did not pour out his soul unto death so that we could partake of corrupt practices. We must make the appropriate effort. Every child of God needs to concentrate and devote himself to forsaking the useless works of the flesh. And uh, in doing so, if we have the right attitude, forsaking those things, embracing the proper things, being led by the Spirit as the Spirit teaches in the Word, then other members of the body of Christ will see examples that will inspire and encourage them. There was a fine preacher named Summer, big imposing as a, as a hummer. He had us enthralled, but the timer then called, and he had to quit. Bummer. <laughs> Gary, that was excellent, really. I just fascinated the way he handles the language and breaks it apart, like I said, and puts it back together again and makes it understandable. Just super. Uh, we'll be adjourned for about 10 minutes, and uh, then let's reassemble again at the bottom of the hour.